problem using technology is sometimes it does not work, sometimes it works great. But I, again, I do apologize for that. As we come upon the Christmas season, one thing that we look upon is Christ's birth. And when we focus on Christ's birth, I was talking to Grace today, and she was like, you know, why there's so many different stories about the birth of Christ? And the reason is you can look at the birth of Christ from all different angles. And you're not misrepresenting any of it. You're not making things up. You're just looking at it from different angles. You can do it like looking at a church service. My perspective is going to be a lot different than Seth's perspective. I'm standing up here. Seth is listening. Seth's perspective is going to be a lot different than Zach's perspective or Ian's perspective. Because we all are looking at it in a different way. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the three lessons on evangelism that we can learn from the birth of Christ. A different perspective. What I want us to think about is what we can learn about witnessing to others when it comes to the story of Christ's birth. It's all about a message. A message had to be given. Today, we have different ways to send messages. If I wanted to contact Ian, I could text him. I could Facebook message him. I could Snapchat him. I can call him. I can email him. I can drive to his house. I can call Cameron, and Cameron can get a hold of him. I can call Jordan. I can call Becky. I can call Barbara. They can get I can call his mom. There's many ways we can get a message to someone. There's many ways. But here's the one thing we have to remember. To do it, something, someone, has to be the messenger. Someone has to be the messenger. So the three lessons on evangelism that we can learn from the birth of Christ starts in Matthew chapter 2. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. The first lesson that we can learn about evangelism is this. Some people are searching for Christ. When it comes to evangelism, some people are truly searching for Christ. They want to find the answer. They are looking for truth. They are searching hard for the truth. Lesson one, some people are searching for Christ. Let's read Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes and people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Now this word Christ, I want to say, Jesus Christ, that's not his first, middle, and last name. It's Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach, the Messiah. The word Christ is Messiah. There's no misunderstanding who the wise men were looking for. They weren't looking for some guy named Christ. They were looking for the Messiah. When they went to Herod, they said, Hey, Herod, we're looking for the Messiah, the one promised in the Old Testament, the Savior of the Jews, the one to come to rule. See, when we say Jesus Christ, sometimes we forget what that term is. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus, the Messiah. There's no misunderstanding who they were looking for. There's no misunderstanding who Jesus was. He was the Messiah. And he said, he said, we are inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, and not, and not the least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had uh, secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship with him also. Then they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they have seen in the east 
went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I know two Christmases ago we talked about the wise men. And we talked that there might not have been three, there might have been multiple wise men. But what I want to talk about today was who were these men? Were these men looking for the Messiah. One, they were intellectuals. They were not some ragtag group, group of guys. They were called the wise men. They were intellectuals. They studied a wide variety of sciences. The word magi means basically a uh, professor, someone who was an intellectual genius. These were the creme de la creme of the area. They would study, study astrology. They would have studied religion. They would have studied philosophy. They would have been the college professors at Harvard and Yale. They would have been the top notch of the universities. They would have known to be able to look at the stars. They would have been able to understand different religions. They would have understood philosophy. They would understand how kings and queens and rulers work with the protocol. They would have known exactly what to do, where to go. They were also from the area of Iran. They were the Medes and Persians. Now this is important because they were, if, since we believe that they were from the area of Iran where Babylon is, they would have an access to the prophet Daniel's book, the book of Daniel. They would have also access to the Old Testament. They would have access to Judaism. When the Jews were carried off in the Old Testament, when they were carried off to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, they lost access to the temple. Now, that might not seem that significant to us, but that was their form of worship. And what they did, because they still worshiped God, they set up what we now call synagogues. They started in Babylon. And so they would have set up forms of worship in synagogues. And they would have had rabbis. And they would have been, had the books of the law written out and copied. And they would have studied in synagogues. Now, when they left Babylon and went back to the Holy Land, to Israel and Jerusalem, not all the Jews went. Some had an established life in Babylon, and they stayed, and that's why they still had synagogues and rabbis in Babylon. So at the time of the wise men, they would have known about Judaism. They would have studied the Old Testament. They would have studied the prophecies in Isaiah. They would have studied the prophecies in Hosea. They would have studied the prophecies of Daniel. They knew when the Messiah was to come because they studied it. They were searching for the Messiah. They also studied astrology. So when a star appeared that should not have been there, they knew, according to Genesis, that a star would appear. And they said, this is the Messiah. This is a sign of the Messiah. And they would have followed it. These men were not Jews. They were Gentiles. They were intellectuals. They studied and they knew the signs, and they were searching for the Messiah. They were hungry for the truth. They traveled a far distance. When I lived in New Jersey, we had a church that was about 45 minutes away. Not that far, but on a Friday or Saturday night, it would take you about two hours because of travel. You'd get onto the highway and just park the car. And then about every 20 minutes, move a couple inches and park it again and wait. And wait. And people are like, wow, oh, you travel such a far distance. Well, it's a good church. They didn't travel two hours. They didn't travel two weeks. They traveled from the area of Iran. And it would have taken them months to travel. Now, today, if we're going to travel and you're going to be gone, say, two weeks, you're going to make sure you have money in your bank account, stay at a couple of hotels. Have a grand time, and if you have kids, you can make sure that hotel has a pool. And if you're smart, make sure they have a free breakfast in the morning. I went to a hotel once, and they gave you free cookies. You walked in, you signed it, or you like some freshly baked cookies? Well, the answer is always yes. Uh, yes, a freshly baked cookie, please be inserted in my mouth. But you would make sure you'd plan it out. And you have resources. But at this time, 
it would have been a journey that would have been filled with dangers, robbers. You would be sleep. You would be staying at inns. You'd be sleeping in the tent. These professional wise men, these geniuses, had to carry all their provisions with them. There was not a Walmart on the way. They were oh, we'll stop at this Walmart. Did you know that you can stay at a Walmart in your RV? You can go on a road trip instead of camping out. You can go to different Walmarts, and you have a free bathroom. You have that free deli. It's a great thing. They did not have Walmart parking lots to stay in. They would have been staying in the woods. They would have been staying in the desert. They would have carried all the provisions with them. Months and months. It could take up to three months for them to travel. So their decision to seek out the Messiah wasn't just a whim, hey, let's go see this. This was thought out. This is okay. We're going to have to spend a lot of money to do this. But they were searching for the truth. They wanted to see the Messiah. They were searching for Christ. The way they got there, they were led by the Old Testament, because the Old Testament said where the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. They read the prophets, but not only did the Old Testament lead them, the Lord led them with a star. He sent them a star. He followed this star. It's the first GPS ever recorded in history. They also followed their own curiosity. They were hungry for the truth, and they were searching for the truth. The same is about people today. People are still searching for Christ. There are many people still searching for Christ today. They can be anyone, though, not just intellectuals. They can be religious people. They can be rich. They can be poor. But this is what they have in common. They are searching for Christ. Some people are searching for Christ in all the wrong areas. They're going to Eastern religions. They're trying to fill it with alcohol. They're trying to fill it with immoral living. They're trying to search for meaning, for truth, anywhere they can find it. But they are searching, and they're diligently searching for Christ. The wise man came to find a Jewish Savior. The one thing these people have in common is it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you come from a good background. It doesn't matter if you come from a different religion. It doesn't matter if you come from anywhere. What matters is this. There are people searching for truth and a messenger needs to be given. The wise men were given the messenger of the Old Testament, a star, and King Herod, and their curiosity. Today, the people searching for Christ are giving you. Are you going to be that messenger? There are people in our lives searching for Christ, and you are the messenger God is sending. He's not giving them a star. He's giving them you. He's not giving them the Old Testament. He's giving them you. You are the messenger for those seeking for Christ. Will you share it with them, or will you deny them the truth? There are people searching for Christ, and you are the messenger. What are you going to do? Lesson one. People are seeking Christ, and you are the messenger. Our second lesson is found in Luke chapter 2. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 2. The second lesson is this. Some people need to be told about Jesus. Some people need to be told about him. The first lesson is some people are actively seeking Christ. They're seeking the Messiah. Some people, they just need to be told about him. They don't know that they should be seeking. They're not seeking. They're actively doing nothing. But they need to be told about Christ. Read with me Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Luke 2. Starting in verse 8. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, 
who is Christ the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothing, lying in the manger. <coughs> Suddenly there appeared with the, a, a, the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill towards men. So it was when the angel gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Then they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Lesson one. Some people are searching for Christ. Lesson two. Some people need to be told about Christ. Who were these people that were told about Christ? They were shepherds. Now, if you go to Scotland today, you can see shepherds. And you always see these pictures on Facebook or on screen shared, uh, screensavers of this little country road and this car on this road stop and a herd of sheep blocking the road and one shepherd with a staff looking at the car. That's what we think about shepherds, but let's talk a little bit more about what is a shepherd. Well, a shepherd hangs out with sheep. If you hang out with cows all day, what are you going to smell like? You're going to smell like a cow. Lewis, when you work in your chicken houses and you work there all day and you come in, I doubt you smell amazing. You, you, <laughs> I would assume that Kathy would say, no, take those boots off. And you must probably not even put them in the garage. You'd say, oh, you go out in the woods. These shepherds would not just be watching from afar with their sheep. They would have been amongst the sheep. The shepherds, the night shift shepherds, what they would actually do, they would bring in all the sheep into a rock enclosure, and they would lay down or sit in front of the rock enclosure where the gate would be. And they would be the gate. They would be keeping in the sheep. Now, if you have a bunch of sheep in a small little pen, you're going to get feces all over you. You're going to smell bad. You're not going to be high society. You're not going to be able to walk into a city and go, hey, hey, I'm going to go shopping. People look at you, oh man, there's those shepherds. They would have been the lower rungs of society. They stunk, but they also were tough, gruff gods. Because if all of a sudden a bear were to attack, they would have to fend off the bear. David, King David was a shepherd. And what happened? A bear came and tried to take his sheep. And what did he do? He killed the bear. A lion came and he killed the lion. Shepherds were tough guys. These weren't a bunch of intellectuals. They were tough outdoorsy guys who smelled like animals. You didn't mess with a shepherd. If you saw a shepherd in a dark alley, you wouldn't go and try to steal their money. You would go, oh, that guy's probably going to rob me. You'd back away. These were just common, working type people. They were not intellectuals, but they were ignorant of the truth. They were not looking for the Messiah. They were tending their sheep. They were not interested in the Messiah. They weren't going, hey, what's going to happen? You know, I heard about this Messiah thing in the Old Testament. No. They were not searching for the truth at all. They could care less about what was going on. They were concerned with their sheep. But these men were led to the truth by an angel who gave them a message. The angel said, Glory to God in the highest, on earth goodwill peace. They were told that, hey, listen, the Messiah has been born. The Messiah, the one that you've been hoping for, waiting for, has been born. It's in Bethlehem. A multitude of angels helped the first angel. They reiterated the first message. And after hearing the message, after hearing the message, what did these shepherds do? They were, well, better go take care of these sheep. One might be hungry. No, they said, let us leave now and find the Messiah. Let us leave now. Let us not wait, not wait until the morning, not wait until it's convenient. They heard the truth and they acted on it. They said, let us leave now. Today, there are many who are not searching for Christ. They do not care about Jesus. They are not breaking down our doors, asking about the Messiah, asking how their sins are forgiven. 
These people who are not searching for God, they're rich people, there's poor people, there's smart people, there's ignorant people, all different kinds of people from all different parts of the world are not looking for Christ. Anson County has around 27,000 people in it. They're not breaking down our doors saying, hey, where's the Messiah? Tell us about Jesus. In fact, we have some people, we call them C and E Christians. People who come to church on Christmas and Easter. And they'll fill up, fill up the pews, but guess what? They could care less about the Messiah. There are people today who are not looking for Jesus. And in what? They need to hear about Jesus. Because once they hear about it, they act. Like the shepherds, once they hear the message of the truth, that God reveals in them that there is a lack in their souls and that Jesus will fill it. When the shepherds heard the truth that the Messiah has come, they acted instantly. There are people that are waiting to hear so that they can accept Christ as their Savior. But here's the catch. God is not sending them angels. God is not sending angels to their bedside table, then waking up, hey, sleepyhead, guess what? Got some good news. God is sending you. God has given you the message of salvation, and He's sending you to the masses who don't know the truth. You are the messenger God is sending. He is not needing to send an angel because He has a church full of people right here in Pleasant Grove. Everyone here is a message bearer of the truth. There are people that you know who do not know about Jesus. It is your job to tell them. Because when they hear it, they might accept Christ. They might say, you know what? I've never heard that before. Are you willing to be that messenger? Are you willing to share the message of Christ to those who don't know that they need a Savior? The third lesson is back in Matthew chapter 2. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. There are some people who will reject Christ. There are some people who will reject Christ. No one likes rejection. No one does. I asked a girl out one time. Her name was Lana Crony Miller. And I decided that you want. I'm going to ask this girl out. We were hanging out, and I thought, surely she would say yes. She showed me trust. And so I went to her and said, hey, uh, well, what about you and I uh, have dinner one night? Not very smooth, like crunchy peanut butter. And she said, John, I'll never date a fat guy. You need to walk away. Another girl, Amy Finch, I asked out. And again, being smooth as peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter. I said, Amy, you know, I've been praying about it, and you know, I think that God wants us to date. And she said, John, it's like this. You're a hot dog, and I'm a steak kind of woman. And I went, well, I can eat steaks. You're not, no, John. The answer is no. Then there's another named Kate Morris, and or I can tell you, I can date my sister. Katie Kowalski, I said, Katie, I really think we should date. She said, nah, I really just don't see it, John. You know, I, it was fun, but no. And I said, I really think this will work out, Katie. She's like, no, no, it's not. And then we got disconnected. I said, God, send her back to me. So God sent a deer in front of her car. She flipped, spun around upside down a couple of times, and I went to rescue her after our first date. Then she had to pity date me. So then, there's hope, pity dates work. She pity dated me for a while, and I told her I loved her, and she went, okay. And then she got deathly ill. God was on my side fighting for me. And then when she realized, you know what, she actually was better date me, because who knows what God will send her her way. And then I said, hey, Katie, we should get married. She went, well, if I say no, who knows what God's going to do. So... Finally, after being rejected by my wife, she became a wife. But those rejections with Lana and Amy, they hurt. Rejections hurt. And nothing hurts more than when someone rejects Christ, the one that we hold most dear. Sometimes that rejection, we don't understand how someone could reject Christ. I witnessed to someone, and they said, John, I know that Christ is the answer. 
that Jesus is the Messiah, but I just won't do it. I won't accept him. That baffles us. But it really hurts because it's what we hold most dear. But our third lesson of evangelism that we learn from the gospel of Jesus being born, the birth of Christ, is that some people will reject the message. Some people will reject Christ. The first lesson is that some people are searching for Christ. We are the messenger. The second lesson, some people don't even know that they need Christ. And we're their messenger. And the third lesson is some people will outright reject our message. Read with me Matthew chapter 2. So we're going to read again, starting in verse 1, all the way to verse 13. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we see the star in the east and have come to worship him. So when they went to Herod, these men were not morons. They were not shepherds. They were not lower class citizens. They were the Medes and Persians. They were high ranking officials. And they said, listen, we know that the Messiah was born. We saw the sign in the heavens. King Herod heard this. But yet he still rejected Christ. And when Herod, in verse 3, when Herod king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he inquired of them, where was the Messiah to be born? He didn't just get some people. He got the leaders of Judaism and said, listen, these men say the Messiah is going to be born, and it is born. Where is he, guys? Tell me what's going on. The authorities of the day said this. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And when Herod heard this, he secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, Bring him back to me so that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over the young child. And when they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother. They fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented the gold, uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed from their own country another way. And now when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will come and seek and destroy, or try to destroy the child. Herod heard the truth from experts knew the truth and rejected the truth. So who was King Herod? One, we have to understand that he was not the uh, king of the Davidic line. He was in fact an Edomite. He was a puppet king set up by the Romans. He was not a son of David. He was not a rightful king of Israel. He was a political bigwig. He knew the right people. He had the respect of the government. And he had the respect of the religious leaders. He was the man. In no uncertain terms, he was the man. He was a leader of the Jewish people. He had access to the truth. He had access to the temple. He had access for those seeking the truth. The truth was in front of him. He, there was no misunderstanding of what the truth was. He knew who Jesus was and what it meant. The message was delivered to him by the wise men and by the religious leaders. He, no one better could have shared the message of the Christ with him. But yet, he rejected them. And people today will do the same thing. They will reject our message of Christ. They will flatly reject it. And anyone can reject it. Those who are well informed and those who are not well informed. Those and everyone in between. They can know all the facts. They can understand that they're going to go to hell without Christ. 
They can understand by accepting his payment for their sins that they will be ushered into heaven when they die. They can understand that there is an anyone that God will judge their sins and they are choosing to reject Christ. They can have the truth explained to them in theological terms or simple terms. It doesn't matter. They will reject it no matter what. But yet, though they reject it, they still need someone to offer them the truth. One of the things I joke around about uh, with people is I like to ask for help when I know it's already too late for me to help. The washing dishes are just about done. Hey, Sharon, can I uh, help you finish the dishes? Oh, thanks, John, but we're just about done. Oh, trust. <laughs> Asking for help and no. It's still a legitimate offer, but we know it's going to be rejected. Sometimes you're going to share the truth of the gospel with people, knowing that it's going to be rejected. And that is okay. They still need someone to offer it. Even if you know your offer is going to be rejected, even if we know that the answer is going to be no, you still need to be the messenger offering it to them. Because what happens if they say yes? Well, John, my friend has always rejected Christ. What about this time? What about this time? What about this time? If they still rejected it, guess what? That means they're still unsaved and they still need a chance to get to heaven. We should never write someone off. We should never say they've heard it enough. They don't need to hear it again. If they're going to hell, they need to hear the message of the cross. We are without excuse. Yet how many times do we see people we know are not Christians and we keep our mouths closed? How many of your friends are going to hell and you have not shared the gospel with them this week? They are going to hell and we are keeping our mouths closed. Who else is God going to send? You are the messenger. There are people searching for Christ. You are the messenger. There are people who do not know about Christ. You are the messenger. There are people who are going to reject the Christ. But guess what? You are the messenger. It doesn't matter. The lessons are clear. People are searching for Christ, but someone needs to show them. Some people need to be told about Christ, but someone needs to be the messenger. Some people reject Christ, but they still need a chance to accept. You are that chance. The story of Christ was ushered in by messengers. Messengers sharing the birth of the Messiah. Messengers sharing the message. God used the star. God used an angel. God used wise men. Today, 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 God is using you. Will you share the message? Let's pray. Father God, you've given us a message. You've given us marching orders to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is our job to be the messenger of your glorious, glorious salvation. Yet many times we keep our mouths shut. Help us. Help us to be the messenger. Help us to open our mouths and share the gospel with those who do not know it. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As Brent comes and leads us, in the benediction, my question for you is this. Are you willing to be the messenger? Do you know someone today who does not know Christ? Do you know someone today who does not know Christ? If so, say, I will share the message with Christ with him. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to say, I will share the message of Christ with them?